The Grancidillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the last of our Dean's Executive Leadership Series speakers for this year. It has been an amazing year. Uh, we've had some wonderful speakers. We started in the fall in Orange County with uh, Deborah Platt Majoris, who's the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, or she was at that time. She's actually back in the private sector right now. Uh, we had Bruce Rosenblum, the president of Warner Brothers Television, Andy Bird, the president of Walt Disney International, and Bob Eckert of Mattel, which was fascinating given all that they've been dealing with recently. And we did, went to Northern California for the first time and had Bob Simpson, the president and COO of Jelly Belly Candy Company. I am sorry that all of you in Southern California did not get to enjoy the jelly beans. And as a matter of fact, I actually still have some in my cabinet at home. We got so many uh, that evening. Uh, and then tonight, we close out our series with uh, what will be a wonderful evening as uh, Steve Lopez, a columnist with the LA Times, and I will provide more of an introduction of him in just a few minutes, but want to give you a few updates on some things going on in the school uh, before I do that introduction. We are already in the process of planning for next year's Dean's Executive Leadership Series. It's going to be a, a wonderful and special series. We will start on October 14th with Katherine Carlick, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of GE Asset Management Fixed Income. So that's a mouthful, uh, but uh, it will be fascinating and a wonderful way to kick off the year from the, the finance side of the world. Um, I also want to uh, give a special word of appreciation to Farmers Insurance Group. They have been sponsoring this series for the last two years, and so we certainly appreciate that and couldn't do this series and many of the other things we do without support of organizations like Farmers Insurance Group. Just a couple of things going on in the school. Uh, one of our kind of our, our last major events for the summer on June 10th at the uh, Center Club in Costa Mesa, our Grazie Dio Alumni Network in Orange County will be hosting an event called Trends in Digital Media. Uh, we expect a really great turnout. There's going to be a panel there of some really amazing people in the digital media area. So if that's something you're interested in and you can make it to Orange County on June 10th, we would love to have you there. Um, also, uh, just a, a couple of things. We've been working on some new degree programs. So I, as an introduction to one of those, I have a, a quiz for you. It wouldn't be appropriate to come on a college campus without taking a quiz, now would it? Especially those of you that have been out for a while, we want you to sort of keep your brains refreshed on this. So I have a quiz for you. I'm going to read a quote, and then I'm going to give you some names of people, one of whom actually this quote is attributed to. So I'm going to see how well we do on this quiz tonight. So I'll read the quote. I'll give you the four names. I'm going to have you raise your hands and tell me which one you think actually said this. So here's the quote. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. Okay. Now, your choices for the answer, don't you like that this is multiple choice? It's much easier. You have a 25% chance of getting this correct. Uh, Steve Jobs, John F. Kennedy, Colin Powell, or Warren Buffett. So the quote again. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. How many of you think St Steve Jobs said that? Okay. Interesting. John F. Kennedy. Okay, a few of you. Uh, Colin Powell. Okay, and Warren Buffett. So Warren Buffett wins the day, but John F. Kennedy quote. Okay, isn't that interesting? So, of course, here where we talk about developing value-centered leaders, we think a lot about how leadership and learning fit together. And as part of that, we're always looking for sort of new ways and new opportunities of, of finding uh, out how we educate people more effectively. And one of the things that we have done is created a new degree program, a Master of Science in Management and Leadership. This is designed for people who are fully employed. It will be offered at our Orange County and West Los Angeles campuses beginning next year. So uh, it is a... a one-year program, but a 15-month program. So if you know of people that you think might really be interested in that, it really focuses on kind of the soft side of management and leadership skills. Uh, we're really excited about it as a tremendous opportunity to sort of blend that leadership and learning in some very interesting ways. Along with that, we're also rolling out next year some programs for what we call pre-experienced students, students who do not have work experience, which is a a group we haven't always focused on a lot in the business school. So we're rolling out a Master of Science in Applied Finance and a Master of Science in Global Business that will be here on the Malibu campus as part of our full-time MBA programs. Again, designed for students that don't have work experience and really sort of hones their skills from undergraduate and then sends them out into the workplace. 
And then the final degree that we're really excited about is a joint degree with Seaver College's undergraduate business division, and it's a joint five-year degree. It will be a BS MBA. And that program will actually kick off in January of next year, so we're really kind of in the middle of recruiting for that. So lots of really exciting new things going on in the school. If any of those programs sound like something that might be of interest to people that you know, we'd love to hear about that, as well as certainly wanting you to continue to uh, channel good prospects into the various MBA programs that we offer that are still sort of the core of what we provide in the business school. So as we kind of conclude our Dean's Executive Leadership Series this year, you can see there's a lot of new things going on for next year. So we're very excited about kind of closing out this academic year and beginning next year. And a wonderful way to close it out is with our guest tonight, uh, Steve Lopez. Um, Mr. Lopez uh, joined the staff of the LA Times in May of 2001 after four years of Time, Inc. He actually started there doing a lot of work for Sports Illustrated and Time Magazine and various other publications. Uh, prior to that, he was a columnist at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He was originally in Northern California, actually he did his first journalism work uh, as a student at San Jose State on the student newspaper there. He's won many uh, journalism awards for his writing, including the H.L. Mencken Writing Award, the Ernie Pyle Award for Human Interest Writing, and a National Headliner Award for Column Writing. Uh, he is, in addition to being a columnist, many of you are aware he's also a, a novelist and writer. He's written three fiction novels, and one of nonfiction that many of you uh, purchased and had signed tonight, uh, The Soloist, A Lost Dream, An Unlikely Friendship, and The Redemptive Power of Music, just released in April. And again, as many of you are aware, there is actually a book or a movie being made from uh, this book, and uh, Robert Downey Jr. stars as Steve Lopez, and then Jamie Foxx will be starring as Mr. Nathaniel Ayers, who's the musician that's featured in the book. Uh, Interestingly, as I was kind of doing a little background work on um, uh, Mr. Lopez, it was kind of interesting to read what people had to say about him. So here were some of the descriptors that were used. These are the ones that I could actually quote in public that were used to describe him. <laughs> um, he's a classic newspaper guy. He's acerbic. He's provocative, witty, sarcastic, and straight shooting. And one of my favorites was an article that was written about the movie that's coming out. And it talked about a film celebrating idealism, moral courage, and redemption whose hero was a newspaper columnist. Uh, this person thought that was sort of an interesting hero and concluded the article by saying that it's a columnist that, this right, that, that is celebrated as a newspaper man who makes a difference in people's lives. And so it's a real pleasure to have Mr. Lopez with us tonight to share some about his experiences and how that has impacted people's lives. So welcome me in joining Mr. Steve Lopez. Can you hear me? Does that work? So you're thinking this is the business and management school, right? And this is the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. What is Steve Lopez doing here? <laughs> and I uh, unfortunately cannot answer that question. <clears throat> I came here to try to find out what they were thinking. And I'm still not sure. Um, so before I continue, though, I need to find out where those hecklers are. I met a couple of students earlier who said they were coming here tonight as hecklers. I just wanted to know where, <laughs> which direction to look in. I don't see them. Maybe they didn't come. Are you here? Raise your hand. <coughs> There's one of them right there. Um, I think that um, I could talk about a number of different things, but maybe um, since many of you bought this book, uh, called The Soloist. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about where that book came from. And it's a way to talk about what I do for a living and um, to talk, too, about the policy issues if you want to um, get into that. And um, let's see, I'm going to talk for, what, a half hour, and then we're going to have some questions. So let me see what time that is up there, quarter to seven. So here's the deal. Um, the book <coughs> is about a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Anthony Ayers. And um, here's how I met him. Um, a lot of people think that I met this guy living on the streets, and out of the goodness of my heart, um, I thought that I should help him. Um, the truth is an entirely different matter. 
Um, I saw this guy out there, and I was not thinking about him. I was thinking only of myself and the deadline looming, another column due soon, the clock ticking. This is my life, a clock ticking all the time. You got to get to the next column. You got to figure out what it is. So out of desperation, um, that's where this column came from. Anybody who saw the paper today and read my column knows what I'm talking about when I say that the clock is always ticking and many of the columns are just acts of desperation. I, I will be honest, I took, a long, I took a long weekend and I come in this morning thinking, okay, the one column that I know I could write needs a couple more days of work. So what am I going to do? So um, I used a gimmick. Um, I reached into the box under my desk, which has unopened mail. And those of you tonight who told me you didn't answer my call, you didn't answer my email, you didn't answer my letter, everything is collected. It's, it's in that box or it's in my in basket. I hope to get to it eventually. But I thought, okay, here's the column today. I close my eyes and reach into that box and grab a letter and whatever it is, that's going to be the column. So I pulled out this letter and um, it's from a woman living in Sherman Oaks saying that a utility box was installed on the pole outside her house and it makes noise and she would like to be rid of this thing. <laughs> Do you think that's a column? I mean, could that work as a column? Well, it had to work as a column. <laughs> uh, if you've read it, then you may have reached the conclusion that it was not column material. <laughs> but I'm always under the gun. And you don't get to say, on the day when the column is due, I couldn't think of anything. I couldn't uh, pull it off. So on the day that I met Nathaniel, I was actually checking out another column. I was in downtown Los Angeles at Pershing Square because um, I had gotten a tip about um, the cost of repairing the escalators at the MTA stops. And somebody had sent me some records indicating that it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars monthly and that every time it rained, the escalators shut down. And I thought, okay, maybe that's a column. In a city that needs to encourage more use of public transit, it would be nice if the escalators would work. And all that you need in uh, Los Angeles is even just a forecast of rain <laughs> and the escalators stop. <laughs> so. Somebody was making a fortune off of this, and I'm thinking, who do they know at the MTA? Um, do they know maybe somebody on the board of soups or the MTA board? I want to know who's got this repair contract and what the deal is. So I was over there looking into that because that's what I do. I go snooping around, scratching at windows, <laughs> looking for material. And while I was there checking it out, I heard music. And it was pretty nice music. So I turned, and what do I see? But across the street, there's a guy standing with a violin, just fiddling away. And the music sounded pretty good. And I knew next to nothing about classical music, but I knew that it was classical music. And as I stepped in closer to see what was up, I realized that the violin was missing two strings. And I noticed also that the guy is standing next to a shopping cart that appeared to contain all of his belongings. So I'm thinking, all right, is this a column? What do you think? Does that sound like a column? Um, it had potential, right? It had potential. So I looked a little closer and realized he didn't have a hat out. He didn't have the violin case open. He was not playing for money, which made me all the more curious. I found that quite mysterious. And he was in a place near Pershing Square where there are a lot of folks on the street walking to and from work or going to lunch. So I'm thinking, why is this guy playing a violin and he's not expecting to get any money? And where are the other two strings? And as I moved in closer, I saw that the violin was kind of beat up. He had carved the name Stevie Wonder into it. <coughs> it looked like it had been pulled from a dumpster. And I introduced myself, and uh, he looked up at me, startled, and jumped back. And I thought, okay, this may not be a column today. It looks like there are some issues here, and it's going to take some time to get to know him. But I did ask him why he chose to play in that particular spot. And he looked over and pointed, and he said, there is the Beethoven statue. I play here for inspiration. So 
So now this has really got some potential as a column, wouldn't you think? And I took my notes and I went back, and I don't know what column I found that day, I did something else. Um, but I went back looking for Nathaniel, and a couple times I couldn't find him, and then I did find him. And uh, I told him that I wanted to write about him for the uh, LA Times, and he said, well, why write about me? And I said, well, you, you must have an interesting story, and I'd like to know more about how you ended up here um, with a violin that's missing two strings, and I'd like to get you the two strings. And he said, oh, no, I couldn't let you do that. I said, well, why not? And he said, I can't cover that. I wouldn't be able to pay for it. I said, well, it'll just be my gift to you. And he said, oh, no, uh, thank you. But I said, well, you clearly love to play. Um, how do you intend to get the other two strings? And he said, I don't know, because that's my whole goal, is to get the two strings and to try to get back in shape. I used to play better. I'm just trying to get back where I was. So I would see him and uh, stop and talk to him. And each time I talked, he was warmer and more welcoming. And he gave up a little bit more of his story. And then one day, I noticed he had scratched some names on the sidewalk with a rock that he used as a piece of chalk. And I asked who those people were. And he said, those were my classmates at Juilliard. And I said, Nathaniel, you went to the Juilliard School for the Performing Arts in New York City? And he said, yeah. And I said, that's one of the elite schools in the world. And here you are playing this two-string violin. What happened? And he said, well, it's a long story. And um, I asked him who I could talk to and where he learned how to play. And he said, well, you can call Mr. Harry Barnoff. He's with the Cleveland Orchestra. And I said, well, I wouldn't know how to get uh, Mr. Barnoff. And how long is he still there? He says, oh, no, he's probably retired. And I said, well, um, I'll see if I can figure out how to contact him. And Nathaniel, who had not seen Harry in about 30 years, said, just call 216-442-8531. So I wrote that down. I went back to my office. I called the number. Somebody picked up and said, Barnoff Residence. And I said, is there a Harry Barnoff there from the Cleveland Orchestra? And a young woman said, just a minute. Guy gets on the phone, Harry Barnoff speaking. I said, does the name Nathaniel Anthony Ayers mean anything to you? And he said, why, yes, it sure does. What about it? And I said, he's playing a two-string violin in downtown Los Angeles. And Harry started to cry. And I said, what's the deal? And he said, he was one of the most promising students I ever had in all my years. He was a wonderful young man, and he had a terrific future. And it all fell apart for him. And I'm glad to hear that he's alive, but I'm just so sad to hear that it's come to this. Do you know where he stays? Where does he live? And I said, well, he lives on Skid Row. Um, he sleeps on the pavement, and that's his life, but I'll see if I can figure out how to help him. So I wrote the first column, and um, people responded in a way that I had not uh, expected at all. Um, the emails just poured in, and it was for days after the column had run. And I've been doing this for uh, well over 30 years and never had anybody um, respond the way they did to this story. Linda and I were talking about this earlier. Um, they saw this story of second chances and human connections, um, and they saw the power of music to sustain somebody, to um, music as therapy, art as, you know, uh, a way to find peace, a way to find yourself. And uh, they started to uh, send strings and money for strings and sheet music and instruments. And my desk at the LA Times was surrounded by boxes. People had gone to their attics, to their um, closets, and pulled out um, violins, dusted them off, and sent them to Nathaniel um, in my care at the LA Times. Um, one guy uh, threw the violin into um, a chainsaw box, <laughs> which was a little scary to receive. <laughs> and then a bigger box arrives, um, as tall as I am, and somebody sent a cello because um, I had mentioned that Nathaniel liked to play the cello as well. And so I had all of these instruments and all of these good attentions, and I was just so struck by the generosity of readers. 
And I took the uh, instruments, some of the instruments, out to Nathaniel without really thinking about it. And um, he saw them, and he said, well, I can't take them. You know, I, I can't pay for them. And I said, they are from fellow musicians. They're not expecting you to pay for them. They want to help a fellow musician. These are donations to the cause. Um, they've read the story that I wrote about you, and they want to help. And uh, I think that uh, you, uh, you know, don't make trouble for me. I don't want to have to send them back. They don't want to get them back. Just take these instruments. And he looked at me um, as if he couldn't believe that any of this was happening. And by this time, um, it was clear to me that Nathaniel had had a breakdown um, that he suffered in his third year at Juilliard. Um, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so here's this, I mean, Nathaniel's days are about trying to figure out what's real and what's imagined. And here's this gray-bearded columnist coming out onto the street carrying violins and cellos, saying, here, my readers want you to have these. He looked at me as if I had fallen out of the clouds. And he was reluctant, but he said, well, okay. So he took the instruments, and uh, I realized very quickly that I had created one heck of a problem. Um, why not just paint a big bullseye on his back? The guy is living on the streets of downtown LA, um, and I'd just given them these instruments. And uh, I said, you're going to have to leave the instruments with me each day, but you can come to the Times and get them and come out on the street and play them as long as you want and then just give them back to me. I can't have you out here with these things. You're going to get killed, and it's going to be on me, and I can't have that. He says, oh, no, 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 no. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to let anybody get these things. And I said, no, no, I've just got to put my foot down. So I made a connection with LAMP Community. This is a mental health agency in downtown L.A. that deals with the most chronic and difficult cases of mental illness. And um, I called them and asked if they could come and meet Nathaniel. And at the time, knowing next to nothing about mental illness, they came and they watched him and he played some music and they looked at him and I'm whispering, okay, what, what can you do? And uh, they said, well, you know, it's, this, this can be a difficult uh, process. And I said, well, yeah, but what does he have? What do you mean, what does he have? I said, What's the diagnosis? Come on, doctor, tell me what he's got. Let's get some medicine. Let's get this thing moving. I've got to get on to the next column. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's what it is, really, in my um, line of work as a generalist, as a columnist. You just keep moving. You move on to the next one before any reali anyone realizes that on that last one, you had no idea what you were talking about. Just keep them guessing. Keep moving. So they said, this could take quite a while. And I said, um, I don't have much patience. And they said, you're going to need quite a bit of patience to get through this. Um, and uh, Nathaniel um, did not like the idea that we came up with, which is that LAMP community would keep all of these instruments. And I thought, what a great way to get him introduced to that. And he could make a connection and get the help that he needs. And he said, mm -mm, I'm not going over there. And I said, well, I can't let you have them. So I took all of the instruments, put them over at LAMP, and uh, waited for him to go there, and he didn't. And the next day, he didn't. And the next day, he didn't. And the next week, he didn't. And he had told me, I'm not going over there. I'm not going through all of that nonsense, all those people on the street. Not going to do it. And I was frustrated, didn't know what to do. Meanwhile, all of these emails are still coming in. Uh, what a lovely column about Nathaniel. Um, uh, how's he doing now? <clears throat> well, um, he's not doing much better than he was when I met him, and maybe he's not even doing that well, because now I'm worried about him. <clears throat> That's Nathaniel calling me. Uh, he call <laughs> I hate to do that to him, but... <laughs> Mr. Ayers, it's Mr. Lopez. Well, you would know that. You called me. How are you? Um, Mr. Ayers, I am uh, at Pepperdine University talking about how we met. Would you like to say hello to everybody at Pepperdine? Okay, hold on. Okay, here they are. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear them? What was that? Uh, they all said hello to you. I'm talking about how we met and about um, your, your musical talent. Did you play anything today? Yeah, I was playing my uh, 
internet that uh, <laughs> I came by through you and my uh, trumpet, and I came by through you and my violin, which uh, needs uh, an A string. Um, I'll get you the A string. Listen, I saw you playing the violin in the Second Street Tunnel this morning. You did? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Where's Pepper Time? Pepper. Pepperdine is in Malibu. Is it a bunch of people? There's a bunch of people right here listening to this, yes. You remember you and I went and you played music at uh, Palisades Park looking out on the ocean when your sister was here? Oh, uh, yeah. It's just up the road from there. Oh, yeah. Is it a, um, a, a, a group of journalists or students? No, it is not journalists. There are a couple of journalists I mean, in there. It's people who wanted to hear the story of how I met you and the uh, impact that you've had on my life. Oh, it's sort of like a, uh, a fellowship meeting? You might, you might call it a fellowship meeting. Um, uh, is it a banquet of eating, people eating or something? It's not quite a banquet, but I'll tell you what. They probably would have been much happier here if you had been the speaker rather than me. Oh, that's a very... Uh, because, uh, you know... That's very kind of you to say. Um, Mr. Ayers... Yeah, I just... Hello? Yeah, Mr. Ayers, I'm going to call you a little bit later, but I've got to go now and finish this speech. Okay. But I'm going to get you, you want, you want an A string for the cello or the violin? Violin. Okay, I'll call you in the morning. Okay. Thanks, pal. Bye. Okay. I've, I've been upstage, but it's not the, f <laughs> it is, let me tell you, it is not the first time it's happened. Um, I hate to jump ahead, but let me jump ahead and tell you. I'll go back and fill in some of the blanks, but um, for the, uh, when, when they were filming the movie, um, it's a DreamWorks movie, and they asked um, how Nathaniel would be about um, doing a making of video. You know, when you see those, it's not a trailer, but it's a little 15-minute, the making of, whatever movie. And they asked if Nathaniel and I could go and be interviewed for that. And I told them, I said, look, I never know how he's going to be, what kind of mood. You just heard him in a very good mood. Um, but you can get him the exact opposite. And I said, I can't guarantee what we'll have, but we'll give it a try. And um, I said, I don't know how he's going to respond to sitting in a chair with a uh, camera light on and answering questions. So they said, all right, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So we went, and this was on the set of the movie. We sat in these two chairs, and the interviewer was a guy named uh, Craig. Nathaniel calls everybody Mr. or Miss or Mrs., so it was Mr. Craig to him. And Mr. Craig, uh, I, I told him, I said, look, um, just don't ask us tough questions if you're, they're directed at Nathaniel. Um, and, uh, you know, you're just going to have to wing it. But uh, try to keep low key, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So Mr. Craig says, uh, Mr. Ayers, I'd like to ask you the first question. Um, can you tell us why it is that you're particularly interested in Beethoven? And I look over at Nathaniel, not sure what we're going to get. And Nathaniel says, now, Mr. Craig, that is an excellent question. <laughs> and I've got to tell you that from the beginning of my days as a musician, I looked up to and respected Beethoven because he wrote for orchestra. I am an orchestral musician. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be in an orchestra, and Beethoven wrote for orchestra. Now, let's take Beethoven's Third Symphony. He reaches over, grabs his cello, and starts playing. And, you know, Craig is looking at me, the producer and the director are looking at me like, you know. He had like a talk show persona. <laughs> and, he, and he had completely taken over, and then Mr. Craig asked me a question. I got maybe three words out, <laughs> and Nathaniel was like this. You know, Craig, I was just thinking, um, when I came upon that statue in downtown Los Angeles, I have to tell you, I was flabbergasted. <laughs> Who had the inspiration to put such a great man in the center of downtown Los Angeles to inspire the masses? It was inspired, Mr. Craig. I don't know who did it. I have to tell you that I thought that I had come upon a god, and it has changed my life. So you never know quite what you're going to get with him. <laughs> um, I feel a little guilty about putting him on the speakerphone, but... Uh, well, I wanted you to hear him because he's, uh, he's just such a wonderful guy. So where was I in this story that I have to wrap up in about 10 minutes? Where was I? Oh, so I took all the instruments over to LAMP. 
And uh, then I get a call one day, guess who's in the courtyard playing music? He's putting on a concert. I go over there, and there's Nathaniel playing the cello, playing the violin. And um, it was beautiful, and he had an audience. And uh, it was just quite wonderful. And um, I said, that's beautiful. I'm so happy we've made this connection. Now we're going to get this matter addressed, and I can move on, return to my life. I got in the car. I went back to work, and I got a phone call from Lamp. Nathaniel tried to leave with the instruments. We caught him at the door. <laughs> the next time Nathaniel went back, um, he made it out with the instruments. He pulled off the heist. And now here he was on the streets of Skid Row with I don't even remember how many violins and a cello or two. And I was scared to death. And um, I asked him if he would move indoors, and he had no interest. I asked him if he would consider treatment, and he had no interest. And as I learned more about mental illness and what he had been through, it began to make sense. Um, Nathaniel went to Juilliard in the late 60s and uh, early 70s. A classmate of his uh, went on to some um, success. Uh, his name was Yo-Yo Ma. They were in the same orchestra together. And in his uh, third year, Nathaniel had trouble focusing, was hearing voices, and he crashed and burned. The career went off a cliff. What's really tragic is to go through the transcripts, as I did. I went to New York and looked through his file and to see the comments from the jurors who went to each of his auditions so that his scholarship would be renewed. They talk about his amazing talent, this gift. You must renew his scholarship. Bring him back next year. Um, he had quite a promising career and would probably be in one of the great orchestras of the world today if not for being diagnosed with schizophrenia. And the time since then, what is it, 35 years, have been quite difficult for him. In and out of treatment, on the streets, pushing a shopping cart. He went to Juilliard on upright bass. Um, that's what he played because he picked it up in Cleveland in public school, back when we had uh, uh, music classes. In pu Do you remember that? <laughs> Don't age yourselves like that. That was <laughs> um, And when his eighth grade band teacher couldn't teach him anymore, he said, I know a guy in the Cleveland Orchestra who can help you. It was Harry Barnoff. Barnoff encouraged Nathaniel to stick with it. He got a scholarship to um, Ohio University and still was not satisfied because Mr. Barnoff had gone to Juilliard. And Nathaniel, uh, in his first year at Ohio, bought a student standby ticket. Does anybody remember standby tickets? Flew to New York for an audition and nailed it and was told, please, um, as soon as your semester is done, go to the Aspen Music Festival. You'll be studying and performing there. You'll meet your new classmates. You will meet some of your teachers, and then you'll enroll in Juilliard in the fall. You'll be on full scholarship. So this is the man who's now wandering around Skid Row 30-some years later with these instruments, and I'm scared to death. And I decided I better see what he's up against. So I went out and spent a night with him on Skid Row. And this was the night when he was no longer just a column, when I became determined to do something, whatever it took, to get him off the streets. He began that evening um, crushing cockroaches to clear a, a space to sleep, this gentleman that you just heard here on the phone. And he kicked them into the gutter. And the scene around us that night was almost indescribable. I'll do my best, but um, dozens of people, people stark raving mad, people, um, people selling drugs, counting the money in the middle of the street, prostitutes. There are prostitutes living in porta potties and working out of the porta potties. Um, there are sirens. There are tents going up. This is the scene. Nathaniel walks to the curb and recited in a perfect Shakespearean accent for, on this stage, the Hamlet soliloquy. I don't know where it came from, and when I asked him, he said, oh, we had acting at John Hay High School in Cleveland. And everybody did a little bit of Shakespeare. So we're sitting there as he's unloading his cart and getting ready to go to sleep, and I looked at these windows where people were living, and I said, wouldn't you like to be in there? And he said, no, Mr. Lopez, I don't want to be cooped up. I've got my instruments out here. Um, this is home to me. I'm okay. And I said, but if you lived indoors, you'd have more time to play. You'd have a safe place for your instruments. He said, no, I don't need to think about that. He said, but I do look up in there, and I think to myself that Beethoven, Beethoven and Mozart 
worked in rooms like that into the night. They lived and breathed as humans do, and they created something that lasted for centuries. Is that an inspiration to you, Mr. Lopez? Do you think about writers the way I think about musicians? And I said, not enough. He then says the Our Father, and he goes into his cart, and the last thing he gets before going to sleep, two sticks. On one he had written Beethoven, and on the other he had written Brahms. And I said, what are you going to do with those? And he said, when the rats come out of the sewers, I scare them away with the sticks. So you just tap Beethoven and you tap Brahms, and the rats scatter. I'm standing there with my notebook. I'm trying to figure out how do you begin to write this story. And I've had so many moments like that with Nathaniel. I've had difficult moments where he's in a rage, where it's as if another person rises up in him, and it's very hard to be around him. It's exhausting. But I know that that's not Nathaniel. I know that through no fault of his own, he was hit with this thing that hits one in a hundred people and does not discriminate. Rich, poor, black, white, it hits people, changes their life, and everybody who loves them forever. And <clears throat> Nathaniel looked at me and said, I hope you rest well, Mr. Lopez. I hope the whole world rests well. Good night. And he went to sleep. And when I wrote that column, I got a call from... Um, the Music Center, which led to a call from the LA Philharmonic inviting uh, Nathaniel to a concert at Disney Hall. And he said, I can't go up there, Mr. Lopez. That's great. I would love to see it, but I can't go up there. I don't want people to have to pay good money to see great music and have to sit next to me. I live on the streets, and I just don't want to subject them to that. So I called Adam Crane, who is the publicist at the LA Phil and also a cellist. And I said, here's the situation. Can we attend a rehearsal? And he said, why would you rather come to a rehearsal than a concert? And I said, well, can we? And he said, yes. So we went up, and it was uh, another of those great moments. Um, Nathaniel goes up the hill, and he gets mellower and mellower as we get within view of it. He says, Disney Hall looks like an iron butterfly. And I said, you know, because you've gotten me so interested in classical music, I'm going next month to see Isaac Perlman with the National Symphony, and he said, oh, he is molten lava on violin. <laughs> and we got up, and he ran his hand over the performance board, the names Beethoven and Mozart. We walked inside. Adam Crane gave him the VIP tour. We were escorted to our seats. Nathaniel, through Beethoven's third, um, told me that it's called the Eroica, Mr. Lopez. Um, you'll note the interplay between the first and second violin sections. Um, he has become my tutor. And when it was done, he leaned forward, we're alone in Disney Hall, and he says, bravo. And then, because he always has an instrument or two with him, I didn't even notice that he was carrying the violin. He takes the violin, walks up behind the stage, opens it, and starts to play in Disney Hall. A couple of uh, musicians came out. Peter Snyder, a cellist. Um, ben Hong, another cellist introduced themselves, and Peter said, you know, uh, Mr. Ayers, you're an inspiration. He said, you just have, I'm just so impressed with you. I've been reading about you. You have such courage. I'm so impressed. And Nathaniel said, you're impressed with me. You're in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. You guys just p played that flawlessly. And he said, yeah, but look at what you've accomplished. <laughs> when um, Nathaniel started to make some progress and looked like he was maybe going to come in off the streets, a uh, lamp held a room open for him. And I tried, and I tried, and I tried. I tried everything. I tried uh, even to take violin lessons from Nathaniel in that room <laughs> to get him comfortable with it. Um, it almost drove me uh, insane. Um, and Peter Snyder, who had offered to give him lessons, agreed to give him the lessons in that room. And it was the thing that made it happen. Um, after a few times in that room, um, I was out looking for Nathaniel one night, couldn't find him, and was worried to death because Ernest Adams, who slept over in the Second Street Tunnel, had been beaten nearly to death by those kids who saw a bum fights video and went through downtown L.A. with baseball bats. When I heard the news, I thought it was Nathaniel. And when I couldn't find him on the street, I was scared to death. 
looked all over for him, called Lamp the next day and said, I got a problem, I can't find Nathaniel. And they said, he's right here. And I said, well, do you know where he spent the night? And they said, yep, he slept in his apartment. Nathaniel's been in that apartment every day for about two and a half years. He has a little music studio that we've been able to um, build for him with proceeds from the book, from the movie. DreamWorks has just made a very generous donation. They're going to be building a much bigger studio. Um, Nathaniel is going to be the artist in residence. And his goal is to become a music therapist, to have people who are youngsters or with mental health issues find peace and purpose in music. And we don't know how long it might take to get him there. He still resists the kind of treatment that he needs to get significantly better, but we're working on it. This all began with that chance encounter on the street. And you think about it and about how many times you pass right past somebody like that. You don't give much consideration to what put them on the street, where they came from, what the story is. It's very easy to think that somebody who's out there has made a moral judgment, um, a choice to be there. Um, they lack the initiative. Um, they just gave up. But I've been out on those streets, and Nathaniel's story is um, one of thousands. And one day when I went to Lamp to get him, because we go to concerts regularly and to ball games, he likes to come to my house to play music. My daughter was two and a half, I think, when she first uh, met Nathaniel, and he played the violin, the cello, and the piano in our house, and she thought this was magic. To see live music for the first time and not just hear it but see it right in front of you with these beautiful instruments and to feel it coming up through the floorboards and into your body, she thought this was magic. She was just amazed. Um, it, it prompted me to go back and get a guitar that I used to play so that I could try to impress my daughter as much as Nathaniel does. <laughs> Nathaniel is not a big fan of my guitar playing, I can tell you that. <laughs> we played once at Pershing Square, the two of us together. And people would come up to us, and they would look at him first. And they'd think, OK, maybe, maybe this duo could work. And then they would look at me and listen a little closer and walk away. <laughs> Nathaniel, after a while, walked away. <laughs> um, one day at LAMP, he was wearing a t-shirt, and it said, uh, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, Disney Hall, and a concert date. And I said, what's up? And he said, Yo-Yo Ma is coming to town. He said, do you think we can get tickets? I said, with you, yes. We will call Adam, and we'll be escorted to our seats. You're a VIP at Disney Hall. So we went to see the concert. Nathaniel was very excited. He wore a necktie. He wore his best clothes. Um, he had gone to the laundry that day, um, got everything, you know, as, uh, as, cl as clean and pressed as he could get it. We saw the concert, and one of the amazing things about Nathaniel, one of the things that I find so inspirational and so admirable, and um, I just um, cannot believe this, but... There is no regret. There's no pity. There's no self-pity. He doesn't look at those musicians on the stage and think, woe is me. I should be there. He looks at them and thinks, goodness, they play flawlessly. That's wonderful. What an amazing thing. And he looked at Yo-Yo Ma that same way. And we <coughs> went backstage after the performance. Ben Hong, the assistant principal cellist, uh, is uh, close to Yo-Yo Ma, and he made this happen for us. We go backstage, and Nathaniel's looking in the mirror, and he's fixing his tie, and uh, he's nervous, and Yo-Yo Ma walks in, and here are these two guys in this room who uh, came off that same launching pad 35 years ago. And you think of the paths. I mean, you think like this. And I thought, you know, who's achieved more and who's happier? And the answer, you know, is pretty obvious. Yo-Yo Ma has achieved international fame. But think about it. Nathaniel, to get through each and every day, has to figure out which voices and which images are real. And he works through that. And sometimes it's ugly and nasty. He argues with people. He threatens people. They threaten him back. I'm always worried to death that he's going to get into a fight. Um, but each day he finds music. And when he finds it, 
the world stops spinning. And for him, he looks at sheet music, and the notes are in the same places they've been in since Beethoven and Mozart put them there. And it's an anchor. It's peace. It's sanity. He disappears into the music. His eyes close. Um, a couple weeks ago, we went to Disney Hall. 60 Minutes is doing a story on this to be released when the movie comes out in November. And um, Nathaniel played with the principal pianist of the L.A. Phil. And none of us knew what to expect because he hadn't been with a pianist in 35 years. And uh, 60 Minutes had the room set up, and I've got my fingers crossed. They had two cameras on tracks and then a handheld camera. And I didn't know if Nathaniel was going to feel like he was in over his head and be overwhelmed. And the pianist starts, and Nathaniel jumps in on cello, and it was gorgeous. It was just gorgeous. And I was with Ben Hong, Peter Snyder, and Robert Gupta, the 20-year-old violinist in the L.A. Phil who has become Nathaniel's latest teacher. And they all said they were not aware that he was that good, that, you know, with an accompanist laying down that map for him, he just exceeded everyone's expectations. And there he was with his eyes closed and his head back, fiddling away. It was beautiful. The Schubert Arpeggione, the Block Prayer, the Elgar Cello Concerto. I mean, a few misses here and there, a couple of pitch problems at times, but for the most part, just gorgeous, just gorgeous. And here he is in this room with Yo-Yo Ma, and Yo-Yo Ma walks over to him, shakes his hand, and said, you and I are brothers. He says, Nathaniel, anybody who loves music as much as you do is a friend of mine. We are brothers in music. He put his arms around Nathaniel and hugged him and handed Nathaniel his cello. He said, I've got to go meet some other people. I'll take this and play around with it. I'll be back in a few minutes. This is what my life has been like in the last three and a half years since I met Nathaniel, who calls at 7 a.m. and usually right at 7 p.m. Um, to say hello, to check in, and the call usually begins, Hello, Mr. Lopez. How is Mrs. Lopez? How are Jeffrey and Andrew Lopez? How is Caroline Lopez? I hope everyone has had a blessed day. Um, I was wondering if we were still on for the concert, such and such a date. Are we going to this Dodger game, to the Laker game? Um, it's been a wild ride. And um, so many rewards have come my way. People congratulate me for what I've done for Nathaniel, and I have to stop them and say, um, I can't even begin to tell you how much this guy has done for me. The soul searching, just finding myself in a situation where I'm, you know, coming up with new definitions for success, for happiness. Um, it's, it's all been so moving. And it's happened at a time when the newspaper industry um, has been in turmoil. And I had my own doubts about whether I wanted to stay in it because I thought, you know, I've had a pretty good run for 35 years and maybe it's time to go and do something else. And I was so inspired by the people who helped Nathaniel that I wanted to do something like that. And Daryl Steinberg, the state senator who was the godfather of Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act, um, called and said, we need a media director to tell people what Prop 63 is all about, are you interested? And I thought seriously about it. It's only Nathaniel who could have made me think about going into the mental health field. And in the end, it was only Nathaniel who explained to me why I couldn't do such a thing. I told him, you know, I so envy your passion. Um, you're a rare bird. So many people go through this life and never find a passion. You've got it. You had it before Juilliard. You've held on to it living on the streets. You've held on to it chasing rats with a stick. You've kept this, and I admire it, and I want a new passion for myself. And he was the one who taught me that I have my own passion. And we thought back on that day when he looked up in the windows and said, do you think about writers the way I think about musicians? And I said, not enough. And it's Nathaniel who kept me in this business because, as he explained it, I tell stories. I won't be happy doing anything else. That's what I love to do. So if he were here tonight, he would be playing violin or cello for you right now. And um, I want to uh, thank you on his behalf.